listening to Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Hello. Hello. Well, fingers crossed that our audio <laughs> sounds better today. <laughs> we're in a different room that we are is now... much more padded. That Don't sounds weird. Padded <laughs> well, I've actually something. made an effort to make this room more soundproof. We're in the we're now in the nursery room in my parents' house, <laughs> like the the children's room when uh, assorted grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> like there's an every flavor box of grandchildren there are there, there are point. yeah there's enough um, of them. there's a lot of them um none mine but all you know, like quite a variety a variety pack of grandchildren <laughs> whenever um they're here which isn't really actually that often i don't know why they need a whole freaking room but you know grandparents do what they do so anyway i've i've draped this place in more blankets and blackout curtains and even my laundry is hanging up in here for more sound so apologies <laughs> for the uh echoey sound of our message from the universe yeah but we're, and then we're doing what we can our dear Rachel is probably better because we didn't record that together we recorded that separately from because our own Rachel had COVID. Because I had COVID, <laughs> and i'm fine now it took me 10 days to test negative i think that's normal yeah um and my dad was still like wash your hands and i'm like i don't have covid anymore and I'm, but like if you just want me to be clean and hygienic i will wash sure. my hands but i think the not... cdc even says you can go back to work five days later after yeah, I don't, testing positive no. i think that's really weird because when i took it six days later it was still positive my test was still positive so like i feel like they might have just decided eh, well i don't know let's just let them do it and <laughs> i'm not sure jumpstart the economy sure send people back i guess to work. whatever Anyway, um, okay, so it's been such a long time since we've talked about anything else other than like coaching, enrollment, and before that, remember we did our short course promotion, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to bring up two things. One, you know I love a rating and review, if you and I like new yet. ones. Yes, if you haven't yet, uh, please help help some sisters out take mm -hmm. a pause and at the very least hit that five star review but i would so really lazy. love Give me a review i would really love a real review yeah if you like this podcast and you've been benefiting from all of its free wisdom put a dollar in the tip jar <laughs> in the way of giving us a but it won't review. even cost you any dollars no just That's time. Best. time is money and i know that we have had several people find us because they it helps our algorithm when you give us a rating and review, it helps more people find us. And then when yeah. they read the reviews, they say, oh, this might be actually worth listening to. And we've had some people who found us and love us because of your reviews. So yeah. that would be, we would be eternally grateful if you would help eternally. us out. Eternally? Well, why not? I mean, I guess they can't prove that I'm not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's no way to measure that. It's eternity. Um, so there's that. And then also wanted to remind you, because we haven't talked about this in a while, that we have a Patreon community and i am going to be releasing the next episode i'm actually kind of behind on this i meant to do it last month but then i got covid um and i also had to move in with my parents yeah, last month was a blur so so we're doing it this month and i'm putting it out on valentine's day because obviously <laughs> the next i think the fourth fourth i think it's the fourth episode in my um bonus podcast series about dating that i'm doing with um my friend and fellow coach and also Patreon member, Katie Beth, where we dive into the last sort of season's worth of thoughts and feelings and experiences with uh, dating and relationships in general. Um, I have a feeling that there's going to be some wild 
tales. <laughs> you know some up in of this them one. already. Yeah, well, well and I'm going to get into everything that's happened for me since October, mm -hmm. which if you'll recall, Kristen, not everyone listening because you don't know, but you might know on Monday if you listen to that episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are some updates. Yes. There are some things that I had to do uh -huh. in the past few months that were interesting. So teaser. <laughs> um, anyway, that's a series that I do. I also will next month have the next episode of my series I do with um friend Alex, who's uh the community our community ambassador of our Patreon group around uh, quitting jobs. She mm -hmm. quit her job last summer. I quit my part-time gig last spring i guess it was almost nine months ago now and the journey and the ups and downs associated with deciding mm, i'm gonna leave my job which is highly relevant right now yeah with so many people historic numbers of people quitting their jobs so if that's you that's some of you i'm sure just statistically yep. then that might be something very relevant to your situation right now so just if you like bonus content three dollars a month that's it gets you access to any bonus content we put out, which we do on a mostly monthly, sometimes a little more infrequently. It just depends on what's going on. And then in both our of lives. the series that you described are quarterly. Yeah, we do those quarterly. But I'm saying it's every month we put out some typically every month we put out some piece of bonus content yep. episode of some kind. And that's just three three bucks a month. If you do the six bucks a month tier, you get that. But then you also get access to our monthly community hangouts, which are usually hosted by our community ambassador, Alex. And every month we have a different sort of theme or reason for get together. So we've done breath work, like workshops before mm -hmm. we've done, like last month we did like a core, like a coming up with your core desired feelings thing we've talked mm -hmm. about. We did a tarot one. That was fun. Mm -hmm. Recently where we kind of looked at the tarot predictions <laughs> for the year ahead. And then quarterly we do a Krachel hangout, which, which me we're and doing Kristen, this month. That's true. We actually have a Krachel hangout live on Thursday, the 17th in the evening. So 7 if you Eastern. join in the next week or so, you, you can, get you can the, do that too. You get the dating, the latest data dating. Well, you also bonus, get all of the episodes we've ever, all the previous yeah. ones. And you'll be there in time to do our most recent Krachel hangout, which otherwise you'll have to wait three more months, which is just a live hour long thing where people join and ask us anything and we dive into so many different questions and topics and is always really interesting and, and productive we also have a a discord where people can and there's usually people chatting every day. every day there's a section in there for friend dates so i know some of you because i've talked to some of my clients who one of their new year's intentions is to feel more connected and make some more friendships because they've been feeling isolated since the pandemic so if you want to connect with people who are, are of like the, mind. Clearly, they're all here. You're all here together for some kind of similar reason. You have something in common already, then you might find some friends in there. It's already happening. Yeah. So come so, join us. All that for six bucks. So link to our Patreon is in the show notes, or you can just go to patreon.com slash clarity on fire and join us. Um, okay. Here we are for another normal person episode with one of my former clients, Samantha. You want to give a 30 second <laughs> teaser for it? <laughs> well, we start out talking about, um, as is common in normal person interviews, sort of the, when everything fell apart, like mm -hmm. the tower in the tarot moment, we talk about it as her tower moment, mm -hmm. moments, plural, there were multiple of them. Um, and then how she I don't know, like came back from that, but not just came back, but thrived. Mm -hmm. And, and then we talked about how she decided to do her own version of an eat, pray, love journey, but not going anywhere, staying at home because of COVID she literally couldn't go right. anywhere because um, Melbourne, Australia is, has been one of the most locked down places in the world. And so she couldn't, literally could not leave the city, but decided to still do like her own version of Eat, Pray, Love without going anywhere, which was really interesting. So we talked about that mm. a lot too. I'm excited for that part. Yeah. Okay. So you want to read her bio for yeah. a more formal intro? Okay. Samantha discovered Clarity on Fire after Googling what to do when you don't know what to do with your life. 
you are not alone, Samantha. <laughs> but a lot of people find us that way. Yeah. And thanks to that Google search, she now lives a life that is much more aligned with who she is, which is a classic thriver, Virgo, type six, and Ravenclaw. Mm-hmm. After spending her 20s living in Asia, Europe, and even a br- brief stint in the Arctic Circle, she now calls Melbourne, Australia home, mainly for its UNESCO city of literature status, dedication to arts and culture, and Victorian architecture. By day, she is a media and communications manager at a charity that helps Aboriginal children and youth complete their education and transition into their dream career. What a cool job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she got that job um, while we were coaching last time and we we talked about that too. So uh, this is a long one. There's lots, lots of juicy stuff in here. So um, enjoy and we will come back to say goodbye to you more formally at the end. <laughs> Hello, Samantha. Hello, Rachel. We, we're having a good time already because we're laughing about how opposite we look right now. Like Samantha's in this yes. very cute little sundress and it's 95 degrees or Fahrenheit uh, in Australia right now. <laughs> yeah, 35 and, de- like 35 degrees for the Celsius people as well. It, in other words, it's 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 freaking hot. It <laughs> falls hot right now. Um and I'm like looking out my window and you know it was there's snow on the ground in yeah I want to die right in that now. snow. Yeah. I might just fantasize Rachel about that snow and I might I'm just like diving into it. So uh yeah um, we're going through a crazy heat wave at the moment. So that's I just that's wild and I'm sitting here like you know still having COVID bundled up in my sweater (laughs) I mean you can get COVID anywhere anytime but it feels like a winter thing to be sick you know there's there's plenty of people getting COVID here in the middle of summer as well um but yeah and I'm it's Wednesday for me too it's still still Tuesday where you are right Tuesday night right um Mm -hmm. speaking of COVID I actually feel like that's a good segue into like what we were talking about before we hit record, which is when does this story really begin? Because it's hard when you're talking about someone's life there yeah. and we can't literally go from day one. Um, it's hard to figure out where do we start telling your story? And you said, I honestly think it kind of begins at the beginning of 2020, which was mm-hmm. sort of the prelude to some tower moments, tower being that card in the tarot where everything falls apart that I had. So but really the big thing that you were just telling me started before even the pandemic, which was the fires in Australia. Yeah. yeah. I think um, you'll probably remember because in May global headlines, um, it, Australia, I mean, it was Australia, a huge, it was a huge deal. Like, it was heartbreaking. Like half the country, half the yeah. country was on fire. Um, and to be, you know, Australia has, it's a climate that's, you know, susceptible to bushfires or wildfires like California. Like, so we grow up with, there is every year, typically there is a bushfire season, but I had never seen bushfires like this. Um, And I live in a metro city, which is typically untouched by bushfires. Um, But in the regional and rural areas, like it was just, I've just never seen it like that. There was so much smoke. Um, So the fire where I you know, was about six hours by car from where I lived. And I remember going to work in early January and there was like this thick haze in the morning and it was smoke. Like the sun was just covered by this cloud of smoke. And you think about how far away I was. And I was walking to go to the train station and within five minutes, I actually felt really sick. I felt physically nauseous, like I was going to throw up. So I just went I jumped into my car and thought well that's stuff it I'm just gonna go I'm driving (laughs) to work it's the dead I'm not I'm not gonna be and like you couldn't be outside for five minutes and I just couldn't imagine I was thinking my god if this is how I'm feeling and it's six hours away what's it like to be in those fires and just the devastation to animals and so many koalas were killed um, and just so many so much native it was just devastating. It was so devastating. And it was such a um, a real visceral reminder of the impact of climate change. Um, and it was yeah. it was heartbreaking. Um, so we kind of just got, yeah, we really just got through the bushfires. Um, I also had atten- attempted to buy a property with my now ex-partner. And, oh, so funny, you know, throughout that whole time, something just didn't feel right. I feel like I feel like the universe or God or some divine force was like, 
trying so hard to tell me, do not buy this property. Do not. It's like, mm. you idiot, right? Like, you idiot. How many hints did I have to give you? Like, <laughs> everything that could go wrong did go wrong, as in the mortgage broker we got was terrible, the conveyance that was terrible, the agent and the vendor were awful people. Um, and it all ended up falling. The finance ended up falling through. Um, yeah, it, it just it never felt right from the very beginning. And but then the vendor tried to sue us for our deposit. Um, and even though, yeah, I don't think I ever told you that. Um, mm-hmm. but even though, even though even our conveyancer said, which is kind of like your property lawyer, they said, Oh, there's no legal grounds for this lawsuit. There's no way he you're going, you're going, he's gonna win. But it's still incredible incredibly stressful as a first home buyer to think oh someone's suing you for twenty thousand dollars and you've you've saved so hard um to say so to say that um that was probably a lesson as well for me but it was so incredibly stressful then the bushfires and I remember thinking like I want to reset this has been such a terrible start of the year I said I am resetting but of course it was 2020 so I had a small reprieve in February and then March happened and everything went to shit (laughs) um so the pandemic started um so that was the, and clearly everyone went through the shock of that and trying to adjust just to what it all meant. Um, lockdown began, um, and then my relationship with someone I'd been with with a very very long time um, was crumbling. Um, so um, we ended up breaking up in the middle of 2020, around June July. We broke up, and at the same time. Um, a childhood friend of mine was diagnosed with skin cancer, uh, melanoma, a very, very rare form of mel- melanoma. Um, he was my my dead partner, when I, which is debutante in Australia. We say in Australia, right. we say we say my dad because we shorten everything. So he was, um, and he'd been a family, a childhood friend since I was four years old, and. Yeah, he was my age, so 30, 31, and he had, and it was so funny because I just, I remember finding out that he had cancer, my mum told me, and I just really didn't think, I didn't think much of it because in Australia, like, everyone knows someone who had, has skin cancer. (laughs) Right, honestly, yeah. It's the skin cancer, it's it's the skin cancer capital of the world. Um, Yeah, this this climate's not really made for fair-skinned people, and and most so many times melanoma is not that big of a deal as in we we're taught how to watch out for any moles that look suspicious and typically if you, you just so many times people just cut it out right they cut it out and might need a bit of treatment but it's typically not always a big deal and I just believed so so strongly that he was going to be okay um and then he just it was such but it was such a rare form he had and we were raising money for these really experiment like really expensive immunotherapy drugs and that was kind of his last chance and I believe so strongly it would work and it just didn't and I remember um I was probably getting a bit emotional even talking about it still you know like I remember like I think I had broken up with my partner I was living alone we were in lockdown like and you know how strict lockdowns are when we go into lockdown. I've told you how. Like, I yeah. couldn't go. I couldn't have any visitors. I couldn't go more than five kilometres from my house. Every single thing was shut. Like, I couldn't get into the car and see my mum, you know, when I was going through that big breakup. And my mum messaged me and just said, you know, Sean's got two to three months left. The immunotherapy did not work. They think he's got two to three months And I just, like, I went to my bed. I went to bed. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I just, I just went to bed. It felt like someone had given me a sleeping pill. Like I felt like I was sedated or I was drugged. And, yeah, he passed away, I think, June, July, just before he turned 31. And that was, yeah, that was was probably the lowest point I think I've been probably in my entire life, Um, like the mental health impacts of being in a lockdown like that like I would rem- I remembered like every Sunday in morning at like clockwork I would just start crying and I would not even have a reason as to why I would just start sobbing um yeah so that was yeah that was really a tower moment of just immense proportions um so I think that was probably my lowest point <laughs> I'm the lowest point that I had <laughs> Uh, probably my entire life and even without the pandemic so even remove the pandemic it would still be yeah of course it would it it, it would have still been a really tough probably the toughest time in my my life that I can recall 
I mean, um, any one of those things is like something you need a lot of time to recover from. And yeah. you didn't get, you know, the pandemic in and of itself is emotionally difficult to deal with. I, you know, we all know that. I mean, the fires thing, that was traumatizing and scary. And I mean, even that like is, is kind of a big, is a big deal that maybe it wasn't in your backyard, but that's a big um, natural disaster that you need time to recover from. Didn't get that. Um, no. Didn't get time to recover from your breakup before, you know, a childhood best friend passed away. I mean, like, it's like you just kept getting hit and hit and hit and hit while you were down. So of course, like where else would you have ended up other than like the lowest point of, <laughs> of oh, your yeah. life? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I kind of look back sometimes. I think when you look through a really hard time and you think, how did I get through that? Like, yeah. how did I get through that? And I'm I did. I'm clearly I'm I'm here. But yeah, it, it, like often when I tell people that they just their jaws kind of drop, like, whoa, what? And it's like, oh wow, that that's a lot to happen all at once, a lot to go through. Yeah. Um yeah, yeah. Just so a I little bit. Of, just a little bit like people's like they'll go what like so yeah um yes that's I guess I don't really know where to go forward from there no no no. yeah yeah, like um, I have ideas I just wanted I wanted people to understand what you've been through just mm -hmm. in the past couple years to give you know an idea of the scope of you know when you say I've recovered from some hard stuff like they can understand that yes it was some really hard stuff um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so when did you and I start talking again? How soon after that? Because I can't remember. Um, exactly. I, yeah, I think I remember. Um, I, I think earlier in 2020, we we're gonna have a single session or something, and okay. I was, and then the shit just hit the fan, and I was like, I'm just not ready for a coaching okay. session. I'm going through too much grief. So I feel it must right. have been more the second half of 2020. I think it was. I think it was. Yeah, because I think it, it just took some time to get over that. Um, just initial real yeah. intense period of grief and then the look going. I think we were in lockdown for a good three or four months. I don't know. Like we, yeah. I think Melbourne, my city, Melbourne, is like the most lockdown city in the world at this point, like longer than Wuhan or it was just. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I feel like it was more end of 20, second half of 2020. Yeah. It was on, It was pretty close on the heels of your breakup. Like it had not been that long no. post breakup that I talked to you. So... Mm -hmm. Give people an idea, and I'm curious to hear how you talk about it in hindsight. Like, what was your mindset when you were at that really low point? Like, what were your thoughts about life and the world and your possibilities? Like, what, where was your mind hanging out at that time? Oh, um, I don't think it was the... Ugh. I just think I'm just being like a really clown. Like I was very depressed. I think um, I was feeling very unfulfilled in many ways. Um, I had been studying a postgraduate um, qualification, um, and that was going well. But I hadn't finished it, and to do that, I was working part time and freelancing, which meant that I couldn't. I think I was ready to work full time again. I think you coached me out of getting out of a part time job that really wasn't that I was feeling guilty about That's leaving. Right. I that. Yeah. that was really helpful. So I think I was just feeling very unfulfilled in many ways and angry and at the pandemic and all the things that have been taken away from it. so many people. Um, yes, I think I would just be. I just feel like low. I was low. I overall in terms of life and. I think a lot of things because the partner I'd broken up with, we were together for a long time. And I, if I'd been honest, I would definitely have thought that was the person I was going to have, you know, children with, have a family. Um, and that was very clear that was not going to happen. Um, and yeah, I guess. Um, well, and you just turned 30 too. So there's also this milestone yeah, of, of like, yeah right? Like I'm 30 yeah. now and, and, oh, and now I'm single. And I thought that I was going to have kids with this person. And now I'm like starting over. And that was another layer. Oh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, when I turned 30 in September of 2019, I was actually really happy. Um, like I was with that person and I had a Harry Potter oh. party to celebrate my birthday. Oh. It was just so, <laughs> it was just so much fun. And that was, yeah, kind of towards the end of 2019. And then just everything just changed. Six months later, uh, boom, like all yeah, this stuff had yeah. changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
That's, oh, I mean, things can change quickly, both in good ways and not so good ways. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> everything in between. Okay. So I, I mean, I don't know how, how else you would be feeling other than low, you know, after the, after all of that, but it just, I know from very real lived experience that when a bunch of stuff like that happens to you, you start to wonder, am I the common denominator of all of this crap happening to me? Like you start to wonder, sometimes you'll get into victim mode and you'll be like, why is this happening to me? Or even if you're not consciously thinking thoughts quite like that, you'll still be feeling at the effect of all of this stuff that's happening to you. And it'll start to warp your thinking to the point where, I mean, I know in in similar circumstances, I've been like, well, I guess nothing, you know, I guess I'm not gonna be able to find another good job, or I guess I'm never going to be able to like buy a house, or maybe I'll never find a partner. Like it starts to warp. It starts to warp your thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, cause I remember I, I think it was the day that I spoke that I found out that my friend was going to die. Um, and I just couldn't stop crying. And I hadn't, um, I was working that day, my part-time job and, I was just like, I can't work today. I need the day no, off. Um, no. And I, my, no one knew about my breakup at that point. Um, and then my boss, yeah, she, I, I said to my boss, I just need to talk. I, I need to talk to you. I've had some really bad news. And so she called me and I told her that Sean's treatment hadn't worked. Um, and then I just started, I blurted everything out, right? Like I just blurted like I've broken up with um, my ex, with my ex. He's moved out. Um and it's kind of funny because she it's kind of weird that I kind of met her even though I didn't um I only worked for her for a couple of years and I was talking about how sad I was and and what the reasons I led to the breakup which she felt were very very valid for why we had broken up and I just thought it's really hard you know I'm 30 and I want to have kids and it's really hard when you want to have kids to have broken up with a partner at this stage and she said to me sweetheart I was 32 and I was getting a divorce I was Mm -hmm. getting, and I put up with so much crap because I thought, oh my God, I'm 32. If I leave this marriage, I'll never have children. And then six years later, she is remarried. She had twins, a boy and a girl. Um, Mm -hmm. She's, you know, got a a successful business, lives in a mansion. So clearly it's done. (laughs) And she said, you know, you, you know, if it's not right, you walk away. Um, So that was, yeah. So I think that was a, a moment of like, yeah, I knew it wasn't. And also I remember this as well. Like I was just walking, just walking on my lunch break and I think I'd found out that Sean was going to pass away in a couple of months' time. And I just thought to myself, oh, life's too fucking short. It's just oh, yeah. too fucking short. And I just knew that whatever comes next, I just can't stay in what this relationship has become and what it is now. And I'd be lying if I actually said, I'd be really happy and excited to have a relationship or have a part, have a baby with this person, mm. with how the relationship is now. You know, I can fantasize about I want it to be different, but it it's not, you know. Um, so that was it. You know, I walked, walked away. That takes a lot of guts, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> it did, it was it brave. Does. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, I think what happened, I mean, so there are some things you exerted control over like your relationship, you know, choosing to walk away from that. But that doesn't mean that you didn't question your decision. Cause I know that any breakup, usually you're going to question at least one time. Did I do the right thing? But oh, of course. Yeah. A lot of the things that happened to you, you know, were totally outside the realm of your control. And I feel like when that happens, often the response, it's kind of a knee jerk response is let me exert control over anything that I can exert control over. So in times Mm. like that, sometimes we'll, we'll become, and it it can be healthy sometimes, and it can also veer Mm. into unhealthy territory, but sometimes we'll exert control over things like our career, because it feels like the one thing that I might be able to actually do something about in this world Mm. of like the pandemic, which I can't do anything about, or, um, you know, maybe like you feel like I can't, I can't like get married tomorrow, even if that's what I want. So I'll, you know, I'll exert control over whatever else I can to kind of make up for where I feel out of control. And I feel like in a, I think in a healthy way, you decided to take control over what you could 
And so you mm. did end up leaving that part-time job that you had. Yes, I And did. you actually um, ended up getting a much better job. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Might it was um, believed was possible at some point earlier no, in my experience of knowing you. Yeah. I think, um, cause I had been studying for a while. Um, and I did a, I did a post, well, it was basically a master's of, of health promotion. Um, and I'd done, so I really was enjoying it. And I did also a unit around indigenous culture or Aboriginal cultural studies. And I really enjoyed that. And I kind of felt and a couple of years before I had actually done the PR for the uh, Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair Foundation, which is probably one of the largest, um, probably one of, I've had, I think, the largest art festivals of Austra Australian Aboriginal art probably in the world. Uh, and I loved that. I really enjoyed it. So I kind of felt quite drawn to working in the Indigenous space, um, specifically around improving Aboriginal health. And I just kind of knew as well. I was, I'd worked part-time and freelance for a while. Like, you know, you talk about the shit sandwich that, you know, like as in I wanted to study and the shit sandwich was I knew I was not going to be able to work nine to five in a corporate job and study at the same time. I just knew that was not something that I was I would be able to do. Um, so I freelance, I worked part-time so I could balance that. And I was just getting to a point where I thought, if I want to move forward, I, I need to work part, I need to work full-time, sorry. Um, and there was no option with my current part-time work for that to become full-time hours. And truthfully, I didn't really want it to be. Like my part-time gigs were not bad gigs by any means, but I knew they weren't a 9 or a 10 out of 10. It wasn't really where I wanted to be in the long term. And I just started looking, I think after you coach with some coaching to let go of, because I knew that, the people I worked for my part-time gigs would be sad when I left and like they would miss me and they enjoyed working with me. And so there was a lot of guilt and people pleasing I had to work through to mm -hmm. let someone out, let someone else down to actually uh, get closer to what I really wanted. Um, and so I just kind of started looking around and I saw this job advertised um, for a media communications manager role at a charity that helped Aboriginal kids stay in school and also transition to careers. And I read, you know, and they looked up at their website and I was just really blown away. Like, um, you know, like 90% of their Abri year 12 kids, which is like year 12, like your, your last year of high school, but graduating year 12. And that's just like, to put it in perspective on a national scale, only about 65 percent of aboriginal year 12 kids finish year 12 on average where the mm -hmm. non-aboriginal or non-indigenous rate is like 90 percent so that's what we talk about and i'm sure is probably very similar in north america um around you know health disparity and outcomes between indigenous and non-indigenous populations um and it bleeds into everything from you know incarceration unemployment alcohol and drug dependency and addictions yeah. um there, there's almost a, every every health you know outcome box you could think of there's a disparity um, which affects the population's health over the long term and anyway I just saw this program that they were doing and I was just like wow these these guys are amazing they're delivering some really good results and then they've got and with my health promotion study I could kind of see they were creating a program that really fat, went to the root cause of the issue and they had a very long-term and very consistent approach which I really admired and I really liked so I just thought okay you now I'll put an application in and I mean, I might not hear anything for like a week or so, but I'll put it in just to see what happens. And I, I put it in and then two hours later, the CEO of the organization, two hours later, he wrote back to me and said, thank you so much for your application. Please come in for an interview on Friday. It's like, whoa, okay. That's <laughs> wild. I forgot it was so like two was, hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this was Wednesday. So it was Wednesday. It was two hours and I went, I was like, oh, okay. So I had to arrange to... um you know, get to an interview on Friday morning. I went in there. Um, I, the interview went well. And on Monday, I got the job offer. And I was just, I kind of had a whiplash. I was like, what? Whoa, what? That happened really quickly. Um, and it, it was December at that point. So it was getting close to the end, like like Christmas, kind of New Year break anyway. Um, so I really, I think I only had a couple of days in the organization um, in December, which just before, but then I had a three weeks off, which was really great. Um, I'm really lucky to be at an organization where the summer, the Christmas, summer, New Year break is really long. So it was like three weeks. Most typically in Australia, it would be like most companies, it's like two weeks, really. Uh, so th and three weeks was just like, it was such the rest and reprieve that I yeah. really needed. I was just, um, I was so burnt out from the year that I had had 
Um, and it was just so, and also my boss very kindly offered to pay me over that time as well. He was like, oh, I wouldn't want you not having money over Christmas. So he just paid me, even though I hadn't accrued any leave. Which is green so flags, kind of people, green flags, green. right? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. I was just kind of, and I was prepared to be like, well, if I'm poor over Christmas, I'll just suck it up and, you know, it's fine. But he's like, I don't want you to have any money over Christmas to spend. So he just paid me, uh, which was very kind. Um, and it just allowed me to just really like, I went back to my hometown and I just chilled in, you know, region, my reach the regional country town with I grew up in with my mom and my brother, who I couldn't see throughout the whole of lockdown. Like oh you can't God. go more than five kilometers from your house. And they even put here, they put a ring of steel around Metropolitan Melbourne, which basically meant you if you lived in Metropolitan Melbourne, you are not allowed to go outside of Metro Melbourne. Like you would risk an eighteen hundred dollar fine. Like it was serious. So it's like like so I only I think if you would have to apply for a compassionate exemption if someone you right. love is done. You needed like, you know, papers to go to right. funerals. Like so it was a matter I couldn't see them for months, like in being with, with them in person. So yeah, it was just what I needed and it was so lovely to just, you know, I just that rest period was really, really important. And I think at that point. We might have been talking about rereading Eat, Pray, Love, I think. It came up. In yeah. Our, did it come up in one of our conversations? Or? It must have. I don't remember exactly how it came up. I think, I think I must have told you, if you hadn't read it before, had you read it before? I did. I read it in my early 20s. Okay. I like, so I was... Okay. Okay. So I was telling you, I think it's time for you to reread it because I, I just could, maybe I could tell you were at that point. Well, you'd just gone through a big breakup and now you're in your, your early thirties and, um, you know, you're asking yourself some existential questions about what do I want out of my life? And it just felt like the right time for you to read a book that's about all Mm. of those things. Um, but also because I remember you saying that you felt the urge to travel, but like you couldn't do it because you were like literally stuck at home and you were Mm -hmm. feeling stifled. And then you read this book and you were like, well, I, I mean, I can't go anywhere, but that doesn't mean that I can't create my own eat, pray, love. So now we have to talk about how you did that while staying at home. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess it, it can, I don't, yeah, I don't remember how we started talking about eat, pray, love. Um, and I had read it in my early twenties and I was just, at the time when I read it, I just thought it was fine. It was a pleasant read. There was nothing bad about it. There was nothing amazing about it. I just think I was too young to really understand why that book was impacting so many people, particularly women, in such a profound and deep way. Um, yeah. I was. I read it while I was traveling in Italy because I just thought it would be fun to read a book partially set in Italy when I was in Italy. Um, and I just mm-hmm. thought it was. And I just remember feeling, because I must have been, what, 21, 22 at the time, and Liz Gilbert just seemed like she was a real grown-up, you know. She was so, not old, but older. Like, she was, like, a real grown-up. And it just quite shocked me when I went and picked it up again that she's only 31 in that book. Starts, and I, I know. <laughs> it starts, and I'm like, wait a minute. I'm 31, and she right. got married when she was 25, which is, like, a very reasonable age to get married. but. I don't know what it's also because I feel the movie, I feel Julia Roberts was a lot older than... Yeah, she that, was in her like, 40s already. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think in my head she just seemed like a real grown-up and I didn't relate to it as much. But now knowing, like, I can definitely relate to how brave that was for her to leave, you know, to say, choose to not have a child, to leave that marriage in her early 30s. That I was just like, well, wait a minute, I'm 31. I'm kind of going through something similar. I think it's time to sit down and reread it. And I found this beautiful ind- um, edition of it um, in the bookstore. Um, it was like a blues, like a cl- modern classics cover, and it was so beautiful. And as I was rereading it, I was just highlighting so many passages. Like there's just, I think people write that book off a lot. Um, they do. Just kind of as this narcissist, this like, you know, white lady indulgent yeah. first world problems um yeah but it's so much there's so much depth to it and I don't know where it's because 
I know I have a theory that if something's like passionately loved, it's also going to be passionately hated. Like it's kind of I the agree. flip side of the yeah. coin. Um, so I reading it now at this stage of my life, I just loved it. I just was so absorbed in it. I found it so inspiring and I couldn't stop highlighting passages in it. And <laughs> I just kind of sort of had this idea. Um, it must have been in early 2021 because I think we had gone past the first quarter of 2021 so um I kind of just started back in this in this full-time job um things where we were kind of hoping the pandemic was behind us well (laughs) that's you know maybe that didn't happen um but I just started thinking about oh I really like this idea of kind of being um just dedication like kind of dedicating like a almost like my own version of Eat, Pray, Love for the rest of the year because at that point there was nine months left of the year. Um, and right, so you I had, had like three, you were thinking like three, three month intervals yeah, like three or quarter, something. Intervals, yeah, yeah three yeah. quarters. Is, um, and because she divided her own year into three, I guess for her it would have been in four months. It was, was four months, coming, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I was coming up to, I kind of finished the first quarter of the year. Um, and I was kind of thinking how, you know, I mean, those things like I, I did have at the time, like a deposit for a for a, the equivalent for a deposit for a prop for a house in my bank account, and you know, it, it, if there wasn't a pandemic, I could have taken that money and travelled all around the world, eat, pray, love style. I literally couldn't because the borders were shut, right. and so you needed an ex- you needed a literal exemption to leave the country. So, and there was <laughs> also. So, and as you know, borders were shutting absolutely everywhere, all over the world. There was absolutely no guarantee if you left Australia that the government would let you back in because there was very strict um, like caps on how many international arrives could come to the country. So it was pragmatic, practically, it was not an option for me at all. It just wasn't, it wasn't yeah. feasible. But even if it was, I don't think I would have done it anyway. Um I just knew I didn't actually want to spend that money that I had saved so much, so hard for with the intention of buying a, a house with it one day. I didn't want to blow it all and just travel all around the world for a year. I, I um, you know, Gretchen Rubin, she in her one of my favorite books is The Happiness Project, and she says, you know, I want to change my life without changing my life. So she said, <laughs> well, like, I don't want to have yeah. to like blow through all my money, leave my home and my community and my family and go on this like independent adventure. Um, yeah. So I kind of just divided it for every, like the remaining quarters of the year. So I was brainstorming different ideas for like what would be my eat and what would be my prey and what would be love. Um, and so I ended up being um, like April, May, June, because uh, eat was, I think, for Liz Gilbert, you know, she was a, she was recovering from a very, very deep, dark depression. She had lost a yeah. lot of weight. So it was really about nourishing um, her soul. And so I came up with a few words, but I ended up with, heal heal so heal was my first for april may and june that was the plan so that was going to be the equivalent of eat and then my next quarter was going to be july august september and that was dedicate that i called it dedicate which was the prey which i think again for liz it was the prey was the real commitment to doing very very deep work and deep personal yeah. development and um so i guess i kind of wanted to kind of heal myself physically mentally spiritually from the traumatic year or 18 months I had had um so I wanted to give myself that grace in that time period because I knew that I wanted to do some big things like I wanted to buy a a property that was like a dream of mine but I knew that was going to require a lot of work and dedication um so I called that dedicate um, and then my plan for my last quarter of the year was September, well, kind of October t- until December uh, was harvest. Um, so I kind of had this idea of like I wanted to nourish and soothe my own soul and my body. Um, and then in the first three months and the next three months, I wanted to kind of use the energy that I would hopefully regain from doing that into really just knuckling down and going for the goal even though there would be a lot of work and time and energy involved and harvest was a bit of a mystery of what it was but I just wanted to reap the rewards I guess and like harvest yeah. what harvest that so harvest those six months and what exactly that would look like I didn't really know um 
So yeah, that was my my own version. And I think I liked the HDH. So it was like yeah. a little bit of like it just kind of yeah. would fit like yeah, heal, dedicate, harvest. Um, so that was my ended up being my own version of eat, pray, love. So. All right. So you gotta now you're gonna have to go back and take us through them because they didn't end up being nice three month no little things, right? <laughs> like you know, they yeah. kind of got messy as as life does. So okay, so how did you focus on healing yourself? Um, so I guess clearly I had to first I had to adjust to working full time again. So for a couple of years before that, I was doing a mixture of part-time freelance and studying. So that meant I had a very flexible schedule. So I wasn't used to working nine to five, five days a week and commuting. That was something I wasn't used to. Um, so yeah, you're like shuddering as you like as you're thinking about that. Um so Never again. <laughs> no. yeah. so I just had to adjust I mean really I had to adjust to having a new role and working for a new organization and a new company because that's always a big adjustment but I found that you know I, I'd work a full working day and I'd just be so tired at the end um you know <laughs> I was so tired at the end of the day like I was just like oh I'm so exhausted I just had to I just need to give myself the time to adapt and I knew that I would come and it, it did probably take probably a good two to three months and to before I was like oh before I felt I was in a routine again and like you know I would do a full working day come home cook dinner and then feel like there was so much space in the evening like no I feel energetic again and look at all this space I have in the evening to to kind of do other things um and I think I did like clearly I did a lot of psych I mean I had a lot of psychology and grief counseling so I probably was seeing a psychologist every two weeks um just to really manage my mental health um process my grief um I tried breath work for the first time as well yeah. um that was really interesting with Francesca yes yeah, so Francisca. I did a Francisca, that's right. Sorry, yeah. I felt I was saying her name wrong, Francisca. Um, <laughs> yes, I did like a tarot and breath work um, session, which I hadn't done before. And it was funny. Um, she was, I was, I've heard people saying like they start crying in breath work and I'm like, that's not going to happen to me. And so I was lying down and she was taking me through it. And halfway through, I just started bawling like yeah. an absolute <laughs> baby. And I'm like, what on earth is this? And I just couldn't um, <laughs> So that was really interesting. Um, so I think I was just really focusing on, you know, adjusting to, you know, giving myself the grace and the time period to adjust to being a full-time role again. Um, I kind of knew I really liked my job really early on. Um, I got to go on to like a, a camp with our kids and we got to spend, because um, clearly all the kids are Aboriginal, they have um, a lot of Aboriginal cultural activities and they invited one of our local Aboriginal elders and we had moments where we were sitting around the, like the fire having like a yarning circle and with the auntie and just talking about the dream time stories and all these kind of cultural things that being a non-Aboriginal Australian, I don't think I would ever have had the chance to really experience. And I got to learn all this really interesting cultural knowledge around, you know, bush medicine and bush food. And, and I was just like, wow, this is like my dream job. This is just such a privilege to sit here in circle mm. and with all these, you know, Aboriginal kids and elders and hearing this culture just being passed on and taught to the next generation. Um, and that's just really touching. Um, so that was really beautiful to do that. Um, and I think I just tried to focus on just things that were fun to me. So like, you know, I have book club, my book club I love, books I want to read, things I wanted to do. It was kind of like it had to be a 9 out of 10 on the fun scale for me to do it. Um, so I just wanted to really nourish myself um, and not put pressure on myself to really do anything I didn't really want to do. Um, and clearly I wanted to focus on, you know, really healing myself as well. So I wanted to so do the breath work, do the psychology and the grief counselling, um, just as much as it really took um, and just adjust to a different way of a different kind of daily routine. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of really, I think, my my main focus is for what happened in that April, May, June kind of quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, healing is its own kind of dedication. Like you were very dedicated to the art of, you know, the pursuit of healing, but the difference I think between how you're defining heal and dedicate is that heal to you is this very feminine energy. 
right? It was like Mm -hmm. ease and rest and like restoration of your body Mm -hmm. and your mind and your spirit and like giving yourself, like you said, grace and patience to allow yourself to sort of come back online or like Mm -hmm. blossom a little bit again. Um, Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then dedicate was a little bit more masculine energy. At least that's how it sounds when you describe it. It was more doing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I remember as well, because I was journaling a lot throughout this process. And I do remember writing, I think I wrote to you that my heel quarter was ending towards the end of June. And clearly here, that's the winter solstice time. So Mm -hmm. the winter solstice is really, is is the shortest day and the longest night of the year. So it's the darkest time. Um, And it just, but then from the next day, it's like we kind of talk about with the winter solstice that the day afterwards you have that little spark, that little spark of light comes mm-hmm. back and, it's that, and and the sun just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, so, yeah, now I think about it, April, May, June is our time of the year where it gets darker and darker and darker, which is like the moon and the night. We do associate with the feminine, the sacred feminine of feminine right. energy uh, where the sun is where the masculine energy is. So right. from early July, end of June, early July, I was actually getting, um, it was the sun was growing stronger and stronger. And I feel at that time, I absolutely needed that masculine energy. I needed to have that more sun, fire, more masculine pursuit of things. So I needed to be much more in my like yang kind of, um, um, what would you call it? Like aspect of the self. Like we all have that yin and yang aspect of the self. So I needed to be more in my yang quarter or side. Yeah. I think. So give us a little debrief about what dedicate was about. What what did you do? Well, it's interesting. I thought I was going to go back to study. I thought I was. So I thought a part of actually my heel quarter was I took a semester off my uh, master's study. Um, so I had finished, I think, all of the core units, and I'd also done a couple of electives. And I remember kind of sitting down in early July, ready to, you know, start studying again. And I just, I just didn't want to do it. I enrolled in only one subject. And I was just kind of like sitting there on a Saturday and looking at my 40 minute lecture, checking them every five minutes to see when it was ending. And I was just like, I don't want to do this. I felt like my study was actually really purposeful when I did it. And I think it actually led me to being in the job I am now. But I really done enough. Like I had six more units of study to do to complete the course. And I was just, I just knew I didn't want to do it. Um, and I actually looked up and found that I could actually exit my master's and get a postgraduate diploma instead of a master's degree. Um, so that was that ended. So I thought Dedicate was going to be around that learning. Um, and instead, I actually won a place in a very intense um, personal development program with this amazing dating and relationships coach called Belinda Bailey. And she runs a program called The Love Codes. And it was starting around July again, and it was a good 12 weeks. Um, and I remember really wanting to do it at the time, but I just knew I, it would have been a couple of thousand dollars to do that program. And I just felt I couldn't, I didn't feel good about spending that money when I had this goal of buying a property because every, when you're buying a property, every hundred, every thousand dollar, you know, bundle you have, it counts. It counts like, you know, the expenses just keep going and growing. Um, and so that she runs like a, um, every year her as a family, they offer one free place a year. And so I decided to sit down and I thought, you know, well, I'm probably not going to win it, but I'll just give it, oh, well, I'll put my, I'll enter. And you had to enter your name and write why you wanted a free place in the Love Codes program. Um, and she got so many um, great applications. She decided to just put the top 20 responses literally just into a hat and draw a name out. And I'm telling you, Rachel, I have never won a raffle in my life. <laughs> I have never been a, that person whose name is drawn out of a hat, never. And um, I logged onto Instagram and she had tagged me in the post and she had, ac- I'd actually won. And I couldn't believe it. I was just gobs. I actually started crying. I was just absolutely gobsmacked <laughs> that, <laughs> that I had won a, a free place in this 12 week program. Um, and so it's funny. I just feel like that was my real education because I thought that the education part of Dedicate was going to be my, my master's degree. 
yeah. but instead it was this program which I would only describe as the artist way for love relationships and dating like this is was this would not like I am not a personal development virgin by any means and this <laughs> just this was intense like this was really brought up so much stuff it was it was challenging but in a really good way um and it just felt like such a wonderful thing um to have to have won and it was something I really did have to dedicate myself to um and in July I also met with a bank met and this time so funny like this time the meeting with the bank <laughs> went so well like I had the most lovely banking manager my mum was on the phone with me he was so kind calm patient um he he explained everything really well I just had compared to the first time I had tried to buy a property this time it was just like everything was kind of going so smoothly um until of course lockdown freaking hit thanks COVID so mm -hmm. um so that put a spanner in the works. Um, so then, yeah, I think I was at a point where I was doing this love coach program. So that was really great, but really challenging. Um, and then I went um, to the bank um, meeting, but then we went to hard lockdown and I didn't want to go for an official pre-approval. So basically once you have your pre-approval, you can start shopping. The bank is basically saying, this is the money we will lend you, and it didn't. I didn't feel comfortable looking for houses um, with a pre. And also, but in at least in Australia, pre approvals are valid for ninety days. Um, so I was had the meeting with July, considered getting a pre approval, and then August we went to hard lockdown. And hard lockdown, of course, meant you were not allowed to inspect any properties in person. You could only do virtual inspections, and I didn't really feel comfortable. Like I wasn't going to buy a place that I couldn't physically walk into and see. Um, so that wasn't going to happen. So that's, um, there we're back to, oh, I feel it's another good three months of hard lockdown as well. Um, so that was a really frustrating time as well. So I was like, hey, this is my dedicated July, now September. I haven't been able to do much. Um, so that was, yeah, that just kind of extended the dedicate quarter by quite a bit, I think. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. You guys have had so many lockdowns, I can't count. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think we had six. I think I could be wrong. Someone Google that. It's right. Five or six, I think. Yeah. <laughs> we eliminated it like five times. And then uh, I think on number six, it just didn't. The elim it was with the Delta variant. It just, the elimination did not work. So, as in, we still kept getting yeah, out getting Yeah. So, basically, the deal became okay, elimination as a strategy is not working anymore. So, we need to get our vaccination rate to a certain percentage point and then we'll open up in line with vaccination. So once we get to 70%, this much restriction right. will open. Once we get to 80%, then this much restriction will open. And pretty much like once we once you get to 90% fully vaccinated, then the lockdowns, the restrictions are pretty much gone. But the Americans are like, what? But there yeah. will never be 90% vaccination in America no, no. ever. <laughs> um <laughs> Okay, let's talk about Harvest, though, before we wrap up, because that's still in the works. So what have you harvested as a result of? Well, I guess I should probably mention that once I got to October, um, right. it was still in lockdown. So basically, Dedicate was going to be extended. And I feel for me, my dedication was until December, really, because by December, I had actually bought my first home. So that's right. I yeah, so once it got to October, um, we were at a point where private inspections of properties were allowed. Um, so you so you couldn't like have 10 people in a home inspecting a property, but you could book in like one inspection at 10, the next one at 10, 15. Um, and I so at, once we got to that point, I got a pre-approval from a bank, so I knew how much money I could you know, spend. Um, and then I found a buyer's agent on Facebook of all places. Um, and when I had one meeting with him and I just had a really good feeling, I really liked him. Um, and I gave him, I wrote him a brief, you know, I'm in marketing, I write briefs for people. So I wrote a brief, like, this is what I want. This is what I'm looking for. These are my deal breakers. These are my must haves. Um, this is my wish list. And within two weeks, he honestly found me my dream apartment. 
Mm. Like this was a plate light. It was just um, this beautiful two bedroom apartment, only eight kilometers from the city. It the the master bedroom has an ensuite plus a private balcony and Love like that. There's, there's, yeah, there's a main balcony off the lounge room, um, but there's a private balcony as well. Um, there's it's so that the estate is just so green. It's really quite like it's really close to a, it's across the road from a major shopping center, which means I have absolutely everything at my fingertips like I'm gonna Gosh. go like after, like after this I'm just going across the road to do some um shopping and stuff for myself um <laughs> I guess so uh which is really it's like, like like anything I want to go to the movies it's across the road it's I'm there in not even five minutes um so it was the cool it's the coolest location um and it just all went so smoothly like everything just it was just like dominoes falling over it was just so there was so much ease to it and I mean don't get me wrong I was shitting myself throughout this entire process like I had some major upper limit problems here where I felt yeah. sick I felt nauseous um but I remember I, I re-listened to a podcast episode you did about when do you know it's intuition and when's it's it's anxiety and if I put the filter off okay if I could just make this property purchase disappear would I take it and the answer was, no, no, I want my property. I want this apartment. Don't take it away from me. Right. And so I kind right. of knew, oh, okay, I'm just hitting a dream I've had since I was 15 years old. And that's scary to reach that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that meant that for the next, that for the whole last six months of the year, I was just, I think I remember, I think we were meant to have this interview in December. And I was like, Rachel, I am not harvesting. I'm plowing the fucking fields right now. Like, this is like, <laughs> this is, I am so tired. Like, I am, because I'm working full time, I'm packing house, I'm buying, I'm, you know, there's so many steps. It's all so new to me. And I was just like, Rachel, we need, uh, I'll talk to you in the new year. So I will have to go. <laughs> um, so I was moving over Christmas. So I didn't have much of a break um, over that. But, and I'm still like, like I have my home property, my housemate agreed to move in with me and be my tenant, which is really great. So I've got some, I've got company as well, and I'm adjusting to living in a new suburb. Um, but I really love it. Like it's so it's near the river and it's near this beautiful um, park as well. And they've done such a good job because it's just like whenever I go in there, there's like all this wildlife, like birds and insects. I can hear it. So like the wildlife, are, they've done a really good job where you can just hear the wildlife are drawn, you know, to mm-hmm. to the parks they've built. Um, so I know it's um. So I guess now, so I guess that's kind of my harvest. I think I think it's been my harvest has been the healing. Um, as well because I didn't tell you this but in December I had a dream where I got back together with my ex and oh, we got wow. back to yeah we got back together and we were engaged and the ring was on my finger but I really wasn't happy about it mm-hmm. like I was really like I was just sitting there and people were around us congratulating us and we were engaged and I just remember in the dream feeling like I'm not happy about this. Um, so I think that's kind of the healing of letting go that even if we could get back together, I actually know yeah. I would say no. I'd, I'd say no. Um, and I don't want to say that, like, like, you know, my ex I think was in my, he was a wonderful boyfriend in many ways. And I think he came into a, into my life at a time when I wanted a boyfriend and he was a great, wonderful boyfriend um, in many ways. But I know I'm entering where now I want a partner, you know, a spouse, a husband, father of my children, whatever you want to call it. And he just couldn't, we couldn't fulfill that role for each other. Um, so I think I've probably really shut that door behind, behind me. And that took a lot of work and a lot of therapy and a lot of um, introspection. Um, and I think the knowledge I got from the love codes has really helped me to identify when I will when I meet a compatible partner for me and what I need in a relationship and has given me skills yeah. in relating that I probably didn't have before um, and how to be in a really feminine place. What I love about the love codes was that there was so much just real embrace of femininity and sacred feminine energy uh, in a really empowering way. Um, and so clearly I've got my property now and I kind of just want to make it, I want to make it a home um, because mm-hmm. it takes time when you move to a place, like for it to become a home. So I want it to be a sanctuary and I've got all these ideas and I kind of want to focus on, like I kind of, 
so now I basically I moved like heal did not happen in 20 no, sorry harvest did not happen in 2021 and that's okay um so I kind of was like okay maybe harvest can be the next six to nine months like if I got six months of dedicated I get nine months of harvest thank you very much <laughs> I've done yeah. the work I want I want more time so um so I kind of want you know my harvest which I feel I'm in right now I just want to just it's a little bit nourishment but I want to just yeah, reap of what I've sown and the work I did and just move forward. And I just kind of want to do things that make me feel good, like physically, mentally, spiritually. And I'm not talking like a corny, like Hollywood makeover, but more like, you know, I want to wear, you know, wear clothes that make me feel really good. And I want to do feminine things I love. Like I like skincare and I like having my hair blow dried and just because it makes me feel good. Um, And I think that's that real feminine kind of, things that are just really joyful and really nourishing and I think that's what I want to focus on um as kind of harvest is kind of going to be my theme for the year um and just kind of closing that heel and dedicate those doors of heel and dedicate and closing them um yeah so that's what I'm focusing on what a journey you've been I mean to see where you are versus where you were maybe at the beginning of 2020 it's like a whole new life yeah, it is. Right? It really is. <laughs> like new yeah. job, new house, you know, no no boyfriend, right? Yeah. Like um I mean, you've you've upgraded in every way pretty much and you're still in the process of upgrading. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I don't know exactly what harvest will really bring because as I I had to adapt. I think, you know, being a pandemic, I had to adapt. I had to be flexible. Like, you know, we we we've all had to be in the pandemic. Um so I was like, okay, well I'll shift. I feel like I've done a lot of work. Like I've done a lot of work on lots of different levels and lots of different definitions of work. Um, So now I'm really just looking to see where this harvest intention really takes me. Um, But yeah, I'm definitely in a different stage and it feels like almost feels so I feel like a different person but it is just a weird it's a completely different place to be compared to where I was even like maybe end of 2019 when not before just before the pandemic hit but then also a lot of things were crumbling like trying to buy a property and getting sued and things yeah. like that um, <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah a lot has changed since then for sure um well I mean, we could, we could talk for ages and ages, but I guess what I want to ask you sort of as the last thing is what, this is hard to put you on the spot. So I don't feel like you have to give a perfect answer or something, but Mm -hmm. what kind of feedback or not feedback, advice, guidance, just comfort (laughs) would you give someone who's in a tower moment right now? Oh, geez. Um, What would you have wanted to hear, right? Like when you were going through it or needed to hear maybe? (laughs) Um, I think that, I don't know, it's like everyone, everyone, I think every human being has a tower moment in life. I don't think anyone. More than one. More more than than one. one. Yes. I don't think any human being. So I think that also helps you to stop thinking, oh, something's wrong with me or I've drawn this. I think everybody goes through a tower moment. Um, and honestly, if you think of anyone in your life, you can probably pinpoint a time where it was, oh, my God, that was a terrible thing that happened to that person. Um, but I think tower moments, they, they kind of prove our resilience as human beings and what we can get through. Um, I think a tower moment is that as well. Um, the unfortunate thing is I think there's no way to go but through you can't go around it. You can't hop over it or go under it. Um, but I think, but I believe that they all, you always come to the other side as much as you think you can't really see it in that moment. Um, but I, I'm thinking, you know, on the tarot thing, you know, the death card in the tarot, there's the death, there's the grim reaper, but there's actually a, a sun in the background. So it shows, yeah, yeah something will close, but the, the sun will shine again. Um, so, yeah, I think they... I, Tower, a tower moment can really strip you to your core and it can really shake every foundation um and they suck when they're happening there's no doubt about that but it will prove to you yourself how resilient you are and yeah, yeah. I do believe as 
the, the sun will shine again. There will be another turn of the wheel. Um, so that's probably what I would um, say. And um, get therapy, basically, by what I would say as well. So um, if you go through a tower moment and you are not booking in with a psychologist on a regular basis, I think you are nuts. Um, right. So that would uh, be to so take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Um, so yeah. get as much support around you as you possibly can, whether that's psychology, a therapy, a coach, a friend. Um, I think that's when you need to really hold on to those support networks and treat yourself to as much support as you can just to, because yeah. it's always going to be tough, but it can, you by getting the right support, you can cushion the blow, I would say. And like you said, depersonalize it, make it feel yeah. like it's not something you've done to deserve it or feel like, you know, I, I, you know, I have been known to say even recently with all of the tower stuff, you know, I've had going mm -hmm. on with my condo or whatever, you know, like, why am I the common denominator of all this crap? Like, it's just really mm -hmm. easy to tell a very unhelpful story about yourself in moments yes. like that. So yes. yes, you do need an outside mm -hmm. perspective to kind of set the record straight mm -hmm. <laughs> in those and moments. Even like I think you said it as well. Like I often, and then like there are times now, yeah, like I, I, I do feel sadness. I don't have, like I'm at a stage in my life where I do want to have a partner and a family and I don't have that yet. And I can yeah. be sad and so I can just sit and think, we well, you know, maybe future me understands this. I can't understand it now and I'm not going to even try to. Um, like even when I was going through with my prop, the first property I tried to buy just blew up um, and I would just at the time say, Maybe future me understands this, or maybe one, maybe one day I'll be glad this happened. Maybe I can't be sure, but not that long ago I drove past the place I almost bought with my ex, and mm. I was just like, and I just thought to myself, I'm so glad that didn't happen. So I could go back to past me and say, you will be so glad you didn't buy it because it would have made everything. Imagine I bought it, and then six months later I broke up with him. That would make things so much harder and worse. Um, so I you think know that's what awesome. I'm, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm thinking right now is to bring this yeah. like completely full circle is, yeah. is that, I, and I have an episode about this that I can link to, um, the Eat, Pray, Love um, at the very end where she talks about like uh, maybe that voice I heard on the bathroom floor was my voice. Maybe it was like the future me kind of coming yeah. back to visit myself and going, go back to bed, Liz. And I'm like, maybe it yeah. was you now who messed up the past you buying that house with her yeah. eggs. <laughs> maybe she sabotaged it on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Like, so uh, like, stop being such an idiot. Like when I give you so many hints to not do right. something, can you please listen? Can you please listen here? So, <laughs> and you know what? It all worked out still, didn't it? Like, it was freaking horrible at the time, but I got so many hits, hints from the divine, at least I believe. So, don't buy this, what, don't do it. But it still worked out. Like, as in, I didn't buy that property, I didn't get sued, I kept my deposit, and right. now I got to use it on a property that I really like and I'm right. really happy with. Right. So, you know, it can all still work out in a weird, funny way as well when you're going through those moments in your life. So, Well, thank you for coming and telling this very epic tale. I feel like it's been a long time in the making because you and I have known each other what feels like a really long time now. Um, yes, I do remember. Yeah, Googling. I, I was at a time just really unfulfilled with my career and I was just like, what do I do when I don't know what to do with my life? And your passion profile quiz came up and the rest is really history. So, yeah. yeah. That's how many <laughs> of our stories start, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Someone yes. takes to Google because they're having an yes. existential crisis. Like, Siri, Thank God. Siri, 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 hey, Siri, what do I do right. in my life? Like, so right. <laughs> That's pretty um, much it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to hear how the rest of your harvest goes and where this takes you but i'm very happy yes, to I see you, you please do i'm very happy to see you on the other side of your tower and it's helping me right now remember that there that if there's one constant it is that things change and mm -hmm. that you know towers by nature just don't last forever that there's going to be another phase yes. and yes. you mm -hmm. just got i mean you don't know how long 
you're going to have to wait or whatever, but it's going to happen. And I'm going to keep thinking about that in the moments I need to be reminded of that. So thank you. (laughs) Oh, good. I'm glad. Yeah. All right. Well, it's helped you too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I will talk to you soon. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Bye. Bye. Okay. All right. Well, again, quick reminder, because it's been, I don't know, an hour since we said it. (laughs) Rating and review. If you want to, if you really like this one, let us know. We always love, uh, we always love your feedback. It, it keeps us motivated to keep going. Praise is nice. Praise is always not nice. necessary, but nice. But nice, you know, it's like a nice to have. It's not a need. <laughs> it's nice to have. Um, okay, we will be back next Friday with a new side chat of some kind. I have no idea what it's about. Oh, and later this month, I will tell you, we're going to be back with an ex. We haven't had an expert on the podcast in kind of an egregiously long period of time. It didn't mean for it to go that long, but it just sort of happened. But I think you're going to be very excited about who we decided to bring back. Bring back. It's going to be very relevant. Yes. So anyway, just some good new stuff is coming. And then that's that. And we'll see you (laughs) next week. Okay, bye.